Hi, I'm Heather O'Neill. Um, this talk is called The Terrible Childhoods of Literary Giants. The beginning of life is when we have the least agency over our own narrative. We are born in the middle of our parent stories. Some of us delight in our childhoods and many of us are horrified by them. The purpose of all abuse is to render the, vo the victim voiceless, to allow others to write your tale. There are many writers who defied this. They had miserable childhoods, but through their imaginations and writings, they decided to redefine their own worldviews, ones which asserted their own nobility and dignity in those of others like them. Maxim Gorky's father died when he was a very little boy. He was so young that he was concerned as much about the frogs being buried alive in his father's grave as he was about the contents of the coffin. Gorky's grandfather regularly beat him unconscious. His grandfather was so good at beating him that the neighbors would send their children over to be beaten too. After his mother died when he was 11, Gorky ran away from home. He decided to shoot himself, but the bullet missed his heart. At that point, Gorky, uh, Gorky changed his name which, to Gorky, which means bitter, and decided to be a writer. With his writing, he discovered that joy and not anger was the bolder, more terrifying stance for a young man to take. Hating your life is an acceptance of your circumstance. To love your life is an act of rebellion, is a declaration of its worth. Gorky laughed in the face of adversity and began to reposition himself as a hero and those around him as heroes. Up until Gorky, Russian literature was the domain of the upper and middle classes. In Gorky, you might find a character like a red-headed child with a blind sheep sailing on the deck of a ship to stay with a great uncle that doesn't want her, or a vagabond with a jar filled with vodka and a glass eye in his front pocket for a fancy occasion. If Gorky wrote Macbeth, his narrative would have followed the witches' home. The rest of the play would have been about their troubled joints, their recipes for eye of newt soup, and how fine they were back in the day in Glasgow. Canada's own Lucy Maud Montgomery lost her mother to TB when she was 20 months, 21 months old. She was sent to live with her maternal grandparents, who were strict and cold. Her aunts and uncles were allowed to come over and insult her. Her only friends were her reflections in the window, two dolls, one with a missing arm, other, another with half a head, and a geranium plant named Bonnie. With her plant Bonnie, she discussed principles of being in nothingness. Actually, I don't know what she discussed with her plant. However, anyone who has ever read Montgomery will know she has an affinity and love for all things petaled, be petaled, or with petals. Lucy was convinced of her own value, even though the people around her told her she was unlovable. And she created a character much like herself, Anne Shirley, who found a freer life inside a book. Although she was lonely for much of her life, she succeeded in creating a beloved friend for lonely girls everywhere. Tennessee Williams' father was a traveling salesman, a poker player, a gambler, and a heavy drinker. By the time Williams was 15, he had lived in 16 different homes, tiny confined spaces the color of mustard and blood. His father took out all his frustrations on his family, drinking and terrorizing them nightly. Williams' mother smothered the children with neurotic, melodramatic affection, but Williams turned his family dysfunction into gold. When your family fights, they pull down the windows so the neighbors don't hear them, but what the writer does is throw those windows wide open. They record the squalor that is family life and expose the deviant human heart. If it weren't for writers like Tennessee Williams, we would think that our family members were the only assholes out there. I thought I was the only person who had an uncle who fell asleep drunk in the bathtub and set the shower curtain on fire. The only one whose cousin got arrested for sneaking his black kitten onto a Greyhound bus. Or who had an aunt who yells at bank tellers dressed in a fur coat with nothing on underneath. He also gave Marlon Brando his first grade part as Stanley in Streetcar Named Desire. When Maya Angelou was seven years old, she was raped by her mother's boyfriend. He was arrested, tried, convicted, and eventually killed by Maya's uncles. After this unspeakable act occurred, Maya stopped talking for over a year. How can a child describe rape and shame when they do not have the vocabulary for it? How can they be expected to put into ordinary words the way they are feeling? What is the language of dignity when your agency and rights have been taken away from you? Maya's neighbor, a woman named Mrs. Flowers, gave her poetry and novels to read. By supplying literature to her, Mrs. Flowers offered Angelou an alternative language, 
one which is able to translate the sublime feelings of beauty and love, but also one which is able to capture the depths and gravity of injustice and tragedy. It was literature that allowed her to speak and speak and speak and be heard all over the world. Rudyard Kipling was born in India, but at five he was sent to a boarding house in London to get himself a proper accent and a taste for tea. In later life, he referred to this house as the House of Desolation. For six years, he was beaten, humiliated, insulted, and locked in an attic. He was made to wear a placard with the word liar written on it as he walked down the street. When Kipling was older, people asked, Rudy, man, why didn't you tell anyone about what was happening? But he did, and this is how he put it. There was a small boy who was lost in a jungle. He was raised by wolves who, despite their smoke-colored hair and sharp teeth, were kind mentors who would loan you a dollar if they could, although they could not. He was pursued by a tiger who had a Napoleon complex despite his enormous size. But he met a bear, and the bear said, you can borrow my giant heart. It will make you stronger and allow you to survive. But in exchange, you have to feel things seven times as much. Thank you.